Hey, deep fried. Unexplained return from abandonment here. Today's episode is about blasphemy and it took me a while to articulate it, even longer to think about publishing it because it's a very sensitive episode. And with that comes a trigger warning. If you're a religious person, we're discussing the crime of blasphemy, which means the descriptions of some of the things that the criminals, so to speak, of blasphemy have done there is no way around describing it which is why i suggest if you're a sensitive person who does not want to know about what has been done or what has been considered punishable under uh, the blasphemy law across the world or what blasphemy as a phenomenon has done to society in the modern times and i'm serious whether you're christian or muslim or hindu there are definite descriptions of how blasphemy was committed and what is considered blasphemy within the country and outside the country, wherever we're discussing this. So, well, I think you should know that information before you listen to the rest of it. I think predominantly reading the Bible and uh, the Quran would be the primary thing that I would approach. I have not finished either of those books. I have read some of them in some parts, in bits and pieces. Uh, as consumption goes, most of it, of course, through critics of said books. But if you're a faithful person or would like to give a fairer chance to religion, I genuinely recommend that you read these books whenever you get the chance in as much depth and sincerity and unbiasedness that you can approach them with. After that, um, I suggest The Portable Atheist, which was given to me by a friend. And it's where uh, my interest in the topic has come in. A portable a- the Portable Atheist by Christopher Hitchens, if I'm not wrong. It's a compilation of essays. Other than that, we will be discussing Salman Rushdie's Satanic Verses. And if you are in a country where the book is illegal, too bad. For those of you who are legal and can find ways to read them, go ahead if you can read the book for uh, the sake of... Uh, confirmed objectivity along with that there is a documentary that i watched which helped me a lot with my research it's called uh, the satanic versus affair it's available on youtube i'll leave a link down in description along with that we're also discussing two different cases as in the ratio density of the cases this is not legally tried neurons by the way new podcast please go check it out it's called legally tried neurons But since it's not a complete legal podcast, we're not going into the facts and the stories and the court deliberations entirety. We're just taking the points that are important to the discussion as Supreme Court's diction on the issue. The first case that we're taking is Ramji Lal Modi versus State of UP. And the other case is Superintendent Central Prison Fatehgarh versus Ramanohar Lohia. I am certain you will find free copies of it online, but the citation is given to you nonetheless in case you have access to academic sources or access to someone who has access to academic sources or access to someone who has access to someone who has access to academic sources. You get the point. Hence, I will now cue the fucking... I originally wanted to start this episode by listing or telling you exactly why we're making this episode, as in... How did it occur in my brain? Because that is a good way to start a story to tell people as to this is what I was thinking about and this is what led to this thought and so and so forth. But we'll get to that because there is a little bit of a story that it leads into, which is kind of the point of the podcast in some ways because the story is interesting. It is quite intense. It is an example of what could happen, what is always on the brink of happening in more ways than one. But before that, we need to visit where have we seen the theme of blasphemy before in the catalog of the episodes. And also because that is where we will find where the laws of blasphemy themselves come from. It's a good idea to start with the origin of a concept like this because it's a peculiar thing. You go to jail for saying something specific against a specific institution in the society. Under most totalitarian assumptions, all of us would assume that it's because it threatens the state. Which is exactly why this law, series of laws about blasphemy also exist. And the episode that I want to throw back to is an episode titled Egyptian Guide to Justifying a Monarchy. 
In this episode, we sort of dealt with the Egyptian pantheon of gods because it was relatively unexplored. But more importantly, to learn a very important lesson because the pharaoh or paro, I don't know how it's exactly pronounced, would claim to his people that he is a descendant of Ra, the sun god. And from there, you can kind of draw easily a connection. The reason it's bad to challenge God in that earlier civilization is because the ruling class, which has established a monopoly on power, depends upon the general people's belief that a God exists, that God is the sun, which gives us the sunlight for the day and so on and so forth. And the descendants of this all-giving entity are fit to rule us. It is a logic that follows, which is why if you question the religion, you question the state, which is not ideal for a monarchy. And that's an observation you will make across monarchies. For example, the Holy Roman Empire, which spanned somewhere between 800 to, what, 1500s? Uh, good, well into 1600s from what I understand from the Wikipedia page about it and also Age of Empires. I'm not very thorough on Holy Roman, Roman Empire, but I do know that the Vatican and the Pope were an important institution within the Holy Roman Empire. More than enough of us are also familiar with the rule of the Caliphate and then followed up by the rule of the Sultanate, both of which were verified by religion. Caliphate, of course, being led by a priest himself. And Sultanate, of course, is a monarch that is approved by uh, the Islamic religion. If you're looking for more examples, if the caste system at all is not just customary and is also based in religion, the Rajput working class would also derive its power from, you know, the justification that they are the running class or the management class of society. Just like Brahmins had claimed they're the educational class, which is why all the educational stuff was to be done by them and all the power and violence and management and anything that would take asserting dominance by violence or the threat of violence and managing resources accordingly was the job of the Rajputs. Now, there is way too much evidence to suggest that there was customary validation to that, but the religious validation of the same is controversial. I'm not saying that there is no evidence for it. In fact, there is enough evidence for a fairly reasonable per person to conclude that casteism very much uh, an idea validated by Hinduism itself. But prima facie, atheism has a space in Hinduism. I'm not sure that how much of it was tolerated. But theoretically, there was supposed to be space for atheists in the Hindu religion. However, if you look at the modern Democratic Republic of India and its laws, you will find very interesting things. First of all, of course, the right to re freedom of religion under Article 25 of the Indian Constitution. Also, it's overlap with right to life under Article 21 of the Constitution. And my favorite curious discussion which will be done today at some point is Section 295 and Section 295, Section 295A and Section 298. In fact, all the sections between 295 to 298 in the Indian Penal Code describe offenses to religion. That is a chapter in our legislation that describes all the crimes, most of the crimes in the country. The most widely applied of them all and the one that has made news in the recent times and caught my attention as well is section 295A of the Indian Penal Code, which says that any insult or attempt to insult religion or the religious beliefs of a class with the deliberate and malicious intention of outraging religious sentiments shall be punishable. Not only that, the crime is non-bailable, which means that a direct bail where bail is a matter of right is not available to you. And it's cognizable, which means an arrest can be made upon you without warrant. It is complicated to make sense of why would a democratic state that has removed itself from religion only recognizes religion as a part of its cultural identity would outlaw talking about God in a dismissive or insulting way. It is difficult to suggest that on paper, in the constitution, in any legislation, you would find that the power of democracy is given to us by God. But the constitutional validity of this 
law because it is a law against free speech which is under article 19 of the indian constitution the court has answered some questions in a 1957 case called ramji lal modi versus state of up the court doesn't say that the state has any inherent interest in religion they say that some activities call public disorder which to a naked eye sounds like a good enough reason to suggest that something should be outlawed if it disturbs the public order significantly but here's the catch we already have outlawed doing or saying things that outrages class sentiments of a class to a point of public disorder under section 153a of the indian penal code however the supreme court also has articulated in several cases that religious disturbance in public order that is not done in fair criticism and is done with the intent to only provoke or in the knowledge of the insult of the religion should be punishable because it disturbs public order essentially the reason section 295a is constitutionally valid is because too many people's peace will be disturbed by the violence that some people might create upon hearing certain words about an institution that has dated centuries and we will reach back we will touch back with section 295a of the indian penal code after i tell you how did i think of this episode or why did i think of this episode as of this point in time i have not designed the instagram promotions and youtube thumbnail of this episode which is why it most likely i can bet most likely it will give you a hint as to who this episode is about and whose book i was reading while i was thinking about this it was of course salman rushdi if you know about salman rushdi i am certain there's at least one little tiny incident a little affair if you will that you would know about even if you've never read his books and only heard his name and interestingly i thought about writing this episode only when i read midnight's children his 1981 book which was critically acclaimed it shot him to fame it was the best seller i think it was the first book that won him an award as such so anyway i was reading midnight's children and to be honest reading it i reaffirmed one of my oldest beliefs that i never articulated till i saw a meme of nicolas cage so there's this meme which kind of shows concentric circles you know when diagrams and you have good actors that do bad movies bad actors that do good movies good actors that do good movies and bad actors that do bad movies you know an intersection of all four so the only person who checks all those boxes that comes in that little intersection of all four a good actor that is a bad actor that does good movies and bad movies is nicolas cage and if you were to apply that analogy to the literary world you would find salman rushdi i think i have tweeted it uh, some time before that salman rushdi is the nicolas cage of the literary world and i say that for a very specific reason is because i genuinely think magical realism has a lot of substance as a literary aesthetic i quite enjoyed the world building elements that were in the books but when it comes to characters themselves and the entire style of narration in these long wounded sentences I am not a fan which is why I find bad writing and good conceptual clarity along with historical references within books really fascinating to be honest if you are not familiar with the history of some of these things I think Salman Rushdie's book is a good place to start it's an interesting place to start it has portraits from the Indian life which kind of have this fan- fantastic element that he shows within his books if you can ignore the panache with which he writes his books and of course we're going to talk about the book that caused the controversy and that sort of shot him to fame and got him the knighthood from the queen of england for literature but before we get to that point in the story we need to know who salman rushdie is beyond 
the provocateur writer who was from british india i mean he was in britain when he wrote the book and he was born in india about 8 weeks before the independence of india but his experience has shaped him to be writing this novel in some ways salman rushdi was born in a liberal muslim family in bombay which in his own words is a muse for his writings somewhere where his conducive writing in terms of atmosphere and story setting plays the best in his own words of course i think there's a bbc interview about midnight children when it was dramatized for an audio book and a radio show is when um, he talked about it and salman has these interactions with religion have been more casual than most people ever have or did in his time he was taken to the mosque on holidays which is eid and he would pray in the sense that he would do what everyone else is doing but other than that nobody that he knows or he himself claims to has engaged with um religion so much and salman rushdi grew up uh, interested in his own people his own history his his own experiences as uh, somebody who grew up in britain after moving there from india and he studied islamic history at the university of cambridge where he comes across a small little incident in islamic scholars where it is highly disputed that it ever happened or is a canonized event most people deny its existence altogether however it is a legend that exists that the prophet took the words of the satan as mistaken advice from or mistaken word of god for a bit and then that misunderstanding was resolved by gabriel the angel but before any of that happens salman rushdi would write two novels grimus and midnight children midnight children in specific of course flirting heavily with the history of india as far as it had been in 1981 and also with the complexity of the identity of a muslim indian and also for everyone else how surreal the moment of partition was how surreal independence itself was how it changed people's lives so on and so forth all of these stories were closely intertwined with historical events that actually happened in india and in fact if you're an outsider who needs to learn about india it's not a bad place to start of course it's a fictional novel and some of the elements of it have been fictionalized but there is a very clear depiction of what is history what is the real and what is magical because the magical stuff is well superpowers and what not after that salman rushdie wrote shame which was a depiction of the political turmoil in pakistan and basing his characters around and about zulfikar ali bhutto and general mohammad zia ul haq and the book of course pissed off the pakistani general and he banned the book in his country but then salman rushdie has the most provocative idea he has ever had and he pulls out that reading of the satanic verses this disputed event of islamic history and he wants to use it as a canon in his next book called the satanic verses and the book itself is actually a fantasy novel that is again drenched in magical realism and in this book salman rushdi takes very heavy religious overtones and takes some of the biggest and most important names in islam and uses them as characters as human figures within his little imagined world i would rather not give spoilers because i think it's one of those books you should read just for the controversy like if you want the goss if you want the tea it's a book that you should read but i'll give you a basic primer of what the book talks about which i read outside the jurisdiction of india because it's banned in india as well which is also what we'll get to eventually the book talks about two individuals who fall from the sky with like from an airplane but from the sky down on modern day london in the 80s when margaret thatcher is the prime minister of england and a lot of the book actually talks about the immigrant experience in england at the time for muslims specifically muslims 
but through the fall the magical realism of the book kicks in and they take up religious figure shapes like the two individuals who fallen down one becomes more like the devil and one becomes more like well the prophet and then the story progresses to cut back and fro to explain this bizarre bizarre reality with an allegory of the satanic verses where the fictional land is called jahila which is what arabia and the area around mecca was called before the prophet ever you know got the word of god and he called his main character mahund which is a slang term for muhammad in in the then christian dominant europe that was bleeding into africa and traveling back and forth on the silk road and interacting with arabia on and off it was a dirty word used for the prophet at the time by non believers the word itself sort of was supposed to resonate this feeling that this was the false prophet along with that salman rushdie also wrote about a scene in a fever dream where a brothel containing 12 women or women who whose occupation is not clearly described or at least it wasn't when i read it to me but it they're definitely in a brothel the 12 women are named after the wives of muhammad and the book sort of ends in character there that's the objectionable material that i could find within the book and to be honest it kind of gets boring after that and i had quite quite a lot of trouble to like get through it but what kept me going with this book was what i learned of the reaction when the world saw this book in 1987 as we discussed previously the first country to ban this book was india even before the book was banned kushwant singh who has who is one of the biggest names in indian literature also happened to be the editing consultant for penguin club penguin who was publishing the book for salman rushdie in india as well kushwant singh went on record to say that this book would not be received in the country and there would be violence when this book is seen by the muslim brethren in the country and penguin classics had confirmed that they would not be launching an indian version or indian edition of the satanic verses however the british edition would be allowed to be imported which means the book would be more expensive and less available in the market itself but this business decision was moot because the democratic republic of india had already banned the book and this was just beginning of the spiral salman rushdie was also invited on every television and radio network possible in britain to defend his views be against people who disagreed with him half a dozen countries also banned the book following the ban of india but then the ball started to roll in the direction of problems and by problems i very specifically mean communal problems so at this point in the 1980s both canada and britain had sizable muslim populations and a lot of the groups of muslims that lived there felt like this was a blasphemous book and under the uk law it must be banned and the person who has wrote this must give some kind of penalty even jail if they needed to and their concerns weren't completely unreasonable because the uk law at the time and the commonwealth law even in canada that is applicable or anywhere in where common law is followed there was pr- provision and legal space to convict people of blasphemy as a crime but blasphemy as a crime was only recognized to be done against christianity like i remember one of the interviews and uh, research things that i saw come across multiple times was that in 1978 the british house of lords imposed a fine of 1000 pounds on a publication that published very lewd content about jesus being involved in homosexual erotic acts but here there was room for a new development in the law that is blasphemy against another religion had to be prevented 
and these demands were vo- vocalized by multiple muslims who were living in london multiple muslims who were living across the world and they were urging their government to do something of course in islamic republics like pakistan the book had already been banned however in england it hadn't been and it was an english affair because this is an english citizen who has been brought into sp- spotlight for something they said against their religion that is not majoritarianly followed but he himself is a follower of the religion since birth or was born into the religion at least but then things quickly spiraled out of the control of the british government and when i say that i am not referring to the time when salman rushdie's book was being burned in the middle of the street by waves of conservative muslims who had gathered before public offices in the uk but i'm talking about what happened on the valentines day of 1988 here's where the other character in this story makes their appearance ayatollah khomeini ayatollah khomeini was the religious leader of iran after the 1979 revolution for those of you who don't know after iran was decolonized by the russians and the british after being invaded multiple times there was a socialist democracy that was left leaning that was going to nationalize oil and the us did not see that to be tolerable so they staged a coup d'etat and put a monarch in place called reza shah who was widely unpopular with the people and was very friendly to the westerners however in 1978 a religious uprising happened in iran and ayatollah khomeini the religious leader overthrew the monarchy and took control of the state the transition was so messy that it caused an international incident with the us people working at the american embassy in tehran had been held hostage and they stayed that way for 444 days and since then the west and iran had a little bit of a bumpy ride in terms of diplomatic relations which continues to this day to be honest but i digress we will get back to ayatollah khomeini's political career a little later by little later i mean immediately the next thread that we're going to talk about but his political thread has a lot to do with what happens on valentines day of 1988 ayatollah khomeini the religious leader of iran issues a religious legal dictum in the sense he takes the power vested in him by god as the religious leader of iran and places a bounty of 1 million pounds on salman rushdi and anyone involved in the publication and or propagation of this book ever since this came to be known as of the fatwa incident because the Caliphate of Iran has now placed a ruling on point of Islamic law which was recognized by the Ayatollah a recognized authority in Islam and hence making it a legal decree called a fatwa while all of this is happening in Beirut Lebanon a militia that is loyal to the Irani caliphate had captured 104 hostages foreign hostages most of them were american and european passport holders of them three were british hostages which means they were british citizens and the british government was slowly but surely approaching with aid and easement of sanctions and a diplomatic tone to achieve the release of these hostages along with other uh, infrastructure help that iran might receive in return for these hostages for example between 1980 and 1988 looking at the instability of iran saddam hussein who at the time was the leader of iraq the neighboring country had waged a war to capture some of the oil within iran and the war mostly took a stalemate for 8 years the irani and iraqi people have been crushed at this at the belly of that horrible machine and restructuring is required rebuilding is required and the irani government was very close to letting these hostages go in exchange for diplomatic relations that were stable and look ahead towards progress at least achieve non interference from the west and from what i have followed there is evidence to suggest that salman rushdie's timing of the book and the fatwa 
might have something to do with that negotiation being derailed for a very long time and the fatwa itself was not dropped by the Irani government for the next 10 years to come between which Salman Rushdie would be in hiding for the most part we live of course far away from the windows change about 57 houses in some 90 days essentially become a security liability and cost for the British government at every waking moment and this paranoia was not unwarranted at the time a 1 million pound bounty is a lot of money for any individual to be offered from a state if you're worried about the hostages I should tell you in 1991 all three of them came home that is came to Britain but relief was not to be sought by Salman Rushdie or anybody involved with the book for a very long time. To make matters worse, in 1989, Ayatollah Khomeini died, tragically, as a beloved leader, a man who was considered father by many in Iran, just suddenly died and his final word over this fatwa sort of became a line on the rock that was unquestioned. To make matters worse, it was very evident that the fatwa was a very dangerous thing for everybody involved. In fact, the individuals who translated the novels to Italian and Japanese were attacked by knives. One of the translators was severely injured and the other very tragically died. However, time went on and Salman Rushdie tried to make amends in all the ways that he could. One of the ways he did was the one that confused everyone around him and in fact if you watch the documentaries or interviews about the incident, everybody is much more confused than, than Salman Rushdie appears to be. Because Salman Rushdie met one of the people who debated against him on UK's television and he converted to Islam again to win popularity amongst the demographic of Muslims and seek forgiveness for his crimes against the religion. Of course, it didn't work. And plus, now Salman Rushdie had aligned himself in his own words with somebody who had justified homophobia in the sense that violent acts against homosexuals and other person who was saying some really misogynistic things in another article, which is why he thought it was time for him to end his flirtation with religion again. And I must remind you that all of this happened uh, over the course of the first five years of the fatwa. And it was only in 1998 that the British diplomats managed to soften the rhetoric over the Salman Rushdie issue with Mohammad Khatami, who was at the time the leader of Iran, as in the elected leader of Iran. And they finally got Iran to say that we would neither support nor hinder assassination operations on Salman Rushdie. To most people, that is considered the end of the fatwa affair. However, it kind of never died because the hardliners within the Iranian politics and in general across the world never forgave Salman Rushdie for his blasphemous acts. Not to mention... Ayatollah Ali Khomeini, the successor of uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, renewed the fatwa in 2005 in a message to uh, pilgrims making the journey to Mecca. But at this point, the entire incident has taken canonization, which was actually kind of a criticism that one of the people gave when the novel came out, that this is an arrogant attempt by Salman Rushdie to canonize himself. And to be honest, it's very easy to see it that way. To be honest, it might actually be semi-intentional that that was to happen. However, it did not remain the only incident of blasphemy we will explore today. I mean, it will be the only story that we explore. But there are other examples that we need to mention at least. The other example I have is a legendary photo in conceptual art called Piss Christ. The artwork is a photograph which is displayed by an American artist and photographer named Andre Serrano. And Andre Serrano's art project titled Immersion or Piss Christ is a cross drenched in human urine. The piece of course caused controversy and caused 
NEA's budget to be cut along with of course um for him to lose artist grants due to the controversy and additionally on April 17 2011 a print of the installation was attacked and damaged beyond repair when it was on display in France of all places i think it's slightly difficult to forget the incident with charlie hebdo his tragic death for drawing well a comic of muhammad and then we come to article 295a and the role of the state in india as it stands today and of course we have to talk about it the munawar fariqi controversy for those of you who don't know on 27th of november 2021 munawar fariqi received a letter from bangalore police that said that his show that was scheduled to happen at a venue in bangalore cannot happen because they cannot allow a controversial figure that has made controversial statements against other religions and gods because of an fir made against him uh, under section 295 298 and 269 of the indian penal code along with section 188 and section 34 all of these are disturbance of peace and spread of disease provisions 295a and 298 specifically being blasphemy laws within the country and it also stated that other states have also banned his shows on these grounds there is credible information that several organizations opposing stand up comedy show performed by munawar fariqi could create chaos and could disturb the public peace and harmony which may further lead to law and order problems i assume it means law and order but it was more fun to read law in an official document submitted by the police to a civilian that that's an actual spelling mistake i'm just making harmless fun now since this is the 12th show that munawar fariqi lost he gave up and he said that i will not be doing stand up comedy anymore he has essentially left his artistic pursuits because the state refuses to protect him against violence from other individuals within the state essentially the point of the story that i'm trying to communicate here in the indian context and the larger world context is that of course in states where the religion is the source of power for the sovereign it makes some kind of megalomaniac sense that blasphemy is outlawed however in democratic republic such as ours the threat that there would be communal and even targeted violence for saying things is a little absurd essentially the threat of violence has transferred from the sovereign to the public only in our case our state categorically and consistently refuses to protect your freedom of speech even when it's reasonable it's not that the supreme court has not declared on paper in theory that reasonable criticism within the bounds of fair criticism of religion within literature within artistic work is allowed by publication in cases like superintendent of central prison fatehgarh versus ram manohar lohia or ramji lal modi versus state of up in 1960 and 1957 respectively that that's allowed however targeted organized violence from citizen groups within the country not being protected from police would be a failure of someone's right even for somebody who is under trial like munawar fariqi for the crime of blasphemy it makes no legal sense that while we keep stating that we are a state that gives presumption of innocence until proven guilty that an under trial must be stopped from a commercial endeavor that has nothing to do with stately duties the last few minutes where you can see that i have speculated what should have been the course of action for certain uh, public authorities is my honest opinion with whatever legal academic ba- baggage i can provide but the larger question still remains that do we as a public that is not enforceable or governed by any state that is powered by a religion need to essentially recognize this collective violent threat 
in the name of any god another thing that salman rushdi himself said in the interview about midnight children's dramatism by bbc radio is that he always thought that his books were aggressively pessimistic when he was writing them but when he reads them now they sound utterly pessimistic because desecularization of india is something that he believes has happened i am completely aware that blasphemy is not something that the palate of the indian media consumer has equipped itself to digest yet but it comes down to the ident question of identity essentially and the reason i pose this question this way is because it is a matter of consensus at this point it is not the state that is malicious and organized and operating people these are people who are willingly putting themselves in the name of a religion in a place and time where they would commit a crime to prevent somebody from speaking at a public venue when it's legal which is why our call on this identity is important that do we want to be a nation where the state which is run by the taxes of the public and the vote and the consensus of the public cannot protect the right to provide religious criticism or autonomy of commentary over religion even with provocative tones i'm not entirely certain why i got pompous when i delivered that last line but there you go that's how things work now i also feel the necessity to mention that additionally the number of people who have been killed in the name of blasphemy is enormous in fact if you could draw lists uh we would require books after books to fill these words together but i wanted to talk about the worst case scenario in modern civilizations and in the way that blasphemy laws are implemented today not by legal decree not by the monopoly of violence that we have given to the state but by the fear of violence of the general public and the threat to cause a riot there is a very specific word that is used in uh, international diplomacy along with uh, media journalism to describe a situation where innocent people are held hostage by a person or a group of people in order to achieve their goal which is to stop someone or start someone to enable their rights or stop somebody from exercising their rights which there is no other legal explanation to stop them from exercising okay everyone that's all i have for you for now um i don't know when i will be back but if you enjoyed this episode and you're new to the podcast please check out rest of the feed we are available as for this podcast all over youtube and spotify and google podcasts and wherever you get your podcasts if you like the content enough to support it monetarily please consider donating a cup of coffee at make buy me a coffee.com which is linked down in the description and if you want to give a more structured um monthly thing then go ahead there's a patreon down in the description as well and if you like memes uh, i'm usually on instagram with at deep fried neurons other than that uh, there is another podcast that has been started called legally tried neurons if you like the content over here and want specific legal niche educational content or are interested in law in formal or informal ways either way there is a podcast for you down there and yeah have have a nice day